Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for wanting to be here and learning something new. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Native Americans, understanding history first. And this is under the context of understanding how this sort of history has played a role in substance use disorder and general um, public health in Native American and First Nation populations today. And this is by myself, uh, Drug Free Communities Coordinator, Ruth Delpino. And we're going to get started. So first thing, um, oh, uh, these are little thoughts. Um, who I am. So um, my name is Ruth Pino. Hi, for those of you that don't know me. I'm a prevention educator. I'm the Drug-Free Communities Program Coordinator. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Global Studies, Political Science, and American Studies. I'm certified in teaching English as a foreign language, leadership, uh, leadership, and life skills training. Um, I'm also um, with the Mercer Council on Alcoholism and Drug Addiction, as well as the Prevention Coalition of Mercer County. Now, um, I do want to talk about why this presentation. Um, first thing, this is not to scare you. Second thing, this is to inform you. This is not a parenting class. You are the best parent for your child. You know them the best. You've probably known them longer than they know themselves. The other thing that I'd want to say is that this is not just for parents. This is for anyone that interacts with a child, whether it's a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, a cousin, a student, whatever that looks like, there is something here for us all to learn about um, the um, history and the subject matter that we're going to be discussing today. Also understand that my perspective is shaped by my approach and my learning experiences. So this means that as a prevention educator, I get access to a lot of different types of trainings and a lot of different types of uh, resources. So I use a lot of those tools and a lot of that um, research and resource and integrate it into the and use it as a lens for the empirical evidence I am finding. Um, and that also means that as a prevention educator, if I do claim something and we learn something new, then we will add that new information into the descriptions below if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, or we will integrate it into new presentations and use that information moving forward because science is something that is constantly reaffirming um, uh, these sort of empirical thoughts and empirical uh, findings. Also, understand that um, a lot of the presentation and all of the presentation is evidence informed and some evidence based. Evidence informed meaning I look at studies, I find them on the internet, I use, I find them in a lot of different places. I use those resources, integrate them into the presentation that is uh, that is going to be there, and I use it in a way where it will fit the presentation. But also, I leave the resources in the description below so that in case you are like, I don't know that th if that sounds right i don't know if i completely want to um, buy into that statement if i want to do more research on that if i want to be extremely informed before making a decision these are all the sorts of things that um, you have access to in the description below all the research that i do all of the resources i find will be listed there and some evidence-based i mean that any of the programs that we do at the council at the mercer council is evidence based, meaning that life skills training too good for drugs, but prints, um, uh, protecting you, protecting me, all those sorts of things are evidence based programs, meaning that if these are evidence based programs, then we are doing presentations through those lenses and pulling from those programs and those resources. So all of this is informed in a lot of different ways, but it all makes up something that is evidence informed and evidence based. So we're going to get into the presentation. Um, first thing is a lot of people may ask, why are we talking about this? Well, one, because it's culturally relevant right now, but two, it's laying the foundation. We are going to lay this foundation to understand that if we have another presentation on something like this or want to discuss more about this, we will use parts of this presentation and these resources to do those other presentations to be a well-informed, empirically founded um, stance and individual. Also, lives are still affected by history. I I think that this is something so important to realize is that a lot of this stuff and a lot of the statements that are being made in these presentations and a lot of the um, findings in this presentation are based around the fact that history is living, it is breathing, it still happens every day because history is just something to look back on to understand the context of where we are now. And that's really what we're doing. 
we're looking at a lot of different ways that especially First Nation and Native American uh, populations have been affected um, by history and how it affects their well-being today. Also, there are a lot, lot um, excuse me, a lot of lack of resources, say that 10 times fast, for this population. And we should help, and it should help us know the disparities that exist within this population. Because if we know this, the disparities that exist, we are able to provide resources based on that disparity. And if we do so, we would be serving our communities in a much broader and uh, better and culturally founded way. Also, it is not up to us to decide history. It just is so when we know we can do better with the information receive we receive so for example if there is anything in this presentation that may be hard to listen to hard to realize hard to um sort of accept these are the things that it's not just that this is something that uh, is meant to hurt you. It's just meant to understand. And if we use that understanding moving forward and we use the information we gather moving forward, we can holistically make better choices about what we do and how we interact with certain populations. Also, um, I do want to say that there is quite a bit of, uh, you know, history being placed in here. And one thing that may come up is the blood quantum rule. So I wanted to lay the foundation for that first, because it is um, something that it it, it, it is, uh, it has a racist history behind it. So um, the blood quantum rule essentially was being a certain amount of Native American or at that time, they said American Indian, uh, First Nation. Um, these are the sorts of things that these populations had to prove their nativeness in order to be qualified for certain resources. And this in its own right affects the way that they access different populations and have access to resources that would help them and bolster their either their socioeconomic status, their mental health, or even their substance use disorder they may be struggling with. So this in itself, this is the reason why we are talking about this, because there's so much that negates their nativeness that if we were to not um, talk about this, we'd be doing a disservice. Also, I do want to say I do not speak for this population. I am not part of the Native American population. Um, I do not have many ties to the Native American population, but I'm going to use their experiences to highlight the points that are being made in order for us to understand holistically how we can help this community in many different ways and how um, we can encourage them to look at different resources that may exist within their community and their populations. So here we are getting started. Um, first off, we're going to start with some really basic history. I am not a history teacher. I do not claim to be, but understanding this can be really helpful for us moving forward. Now, I have quite a few different um, uh, maps in the background just so we can sort of look at this. This is a 1700s map. Um, and this is actually labeled through um, a lot of the white populations and colonizers that have come through. Um, and as we're just sort of understanding this right now, how many Native Americans are there in the United States today? People that quantify, that qualify, that identify as Native American. It's 5 million uh, people that identify as Native American and 78% are not on reservations, meaning that of those 5 million people, 78% of them identify as Native American outside of a reservation. Also, where are they from? Um, they're from a lot of different places. Um, and that's sort of something that we're gonna understand through this is that I know that in some populations, Native Americans may not be very prevalent, but it is also understanding that they're from here. They're from this land. They've been here for a very long time. And that if we understand where they are from, if we understand um, the different tribe, tribes and populations that exist uh, within the context, then we can understand um, the, uh, the ramifications of certain populations. Now also understand that, if we're, especially if we're looking at here, that the history is there, right? So we have quite a different Pueblo nations, which are actually from uh, Mexico and Central America. Um, we have the uh, Cheyennes, the, um, the Crow, the, the Caddo, the Chickasaw, the um, um, Akmugli, uh, my apologies for not saying that correctly, the Cherokee Nation, all those sorts of things, right? So all these different populations. So if we're looking at the way that we are talking about Native Americans, we are talking about their experience holistically, but we want to recognize that each tribe and each certain population of Native Americans has their own traditions, their own way of life, their own language, 
and their own history. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Um, how far reaching are Native Americans to the mainstream? Well, we can actually really look at this in a, a quite a different way also in that Native Americans themselves are, yes, from the United States, but because we have many different territories from the United States, there are also Native Hawaiians, there are also Native Alaskans, there are also Native um, Tainos uh, in Puerto Rico. So when we're looking at this, we're not just discussing Native Americans in the context of, you know, being from Arizona or being from, you know, different areas that have a much bigger population of Native Americans. We're talking about them having a holistic approach in where they are from and what they are doing. Now, why do we need to know about them? Well, they are the basis for a lot of the things that we do. We live on a land that used to be theirs. We live on a land that has been taken from them, and we live on a land that they are so deeply tied to based on their cultures and traditions. So if we are to be here, we also need to understand holistically what that looks like. Um, so uh, we are going to be getting into uh, quite a bit of um, history and some violence that was perpetrated against the Native Americans, but we are going to be talking about the ramifications today. So what we want to do is lay the groundwork and then go from there. Um, so there is a lot of history of violence. It is long and extensive. There is one part of history that I really wanted to talk about because it is something that I don't think is talked about enough, but also something that um, exists on a very broad scale. So there was a ruling in 2020, I'm gonna click on this right now just for, oh, my apologies, I'm gonna click on this right now just for the context of us understanding what we're talking about here. The US Supreme Court, um, this was in 2020, it, I believe it was in July, um, basically said, hey, you know, um, this part of Oklahoma, Oklahoma land belongs to you. And based on the history, it did. And we're going to be talking about some of that history. So there were many different uh, economic opportunities for people, especially in the um, especially in a lot of the tribal communities that lived in Oklahoma. There were so many economic opportunities. It was something that um, was very uh, it was it was very. How do I say this? Um, beneficial uh, to the populations that were living there, but that does not mean that they got the benefits from that resource and from the lands that they had bought outright. Now, the reason why we're discussing Oklahoma specifically is because Oklahoma was a land that was bought by Native Americans and the only land on record to be bought by Native Americans. So it was something that they were like, we're going to buy this land because it was something that a lot of the people that were selling this uh, land um, unrightfully in a lot of ways had said this land is is not profitable it doesn't really have you know good soil it's not a good land to uh you know use essentially and they were like all right here you can have it and they gave it to them at a price where they were had paid and they had papers everything was very legitimate and essentially what had happened especially in oklahoma and this is the one space the one area um, of uh, uh, tribes that had bought land was that when they were there, they essentially had discovered through a couple of years through, you know, farming the land, seeing what they could do with it, was that there was a precious resource and it was petroleum. And petroleum in its own right, natural gas and petroleum and those sorts of things were found on this land. And all of a sudden it was something that was really coveted. It was a resource that many people wanted because it was so needed in um, in the way that uh, American populations were living at the time and into today. So the reason why we're talking about this is because I have a resource for history and uh, it sort of talks about some of the uh, actions and um, laws that existed uh, during this time. And one of them was the Dawes Act. And essentially what it did was it aimed to assimilate a native populations into the mainstream American society by essentially safely guiding them from one um, set of living to another set of living saying, and I my apologies for sounding so crass, but I'm just reading this, safely guiding from the night of barbarism into the fair dawn of Christian civilization. And this essentially was for white Americans. And so they used this, this act and they used these resources and this sentiment 
to essentially use um, that to take away land from Native Americans who had bought this land in the first place. And so there were many different ways that they did this. And one of them was assigning a white man specifically to every Indian male that owned this land or every Indian um, uh, every person that owned this land had a Indian, um, had a um, white male associated with that. And when they're looking at this, and I'm using the term Indian because that was what was in the context, but that is not the word that we use today. And essentially, when we are looking at this, it is saying that they, it was a very racist policy that had essentially said they are not fit to use this land. They are not fit for these resources. Therefore, we are assigning them a white man to make those sorts of decisions. And essentially what it had done was it had given the native the right to the land, but the white man the right to the resource. So in its own right, it was as if, you know, they were, they had the land, but they weren't making the money, but that was the deal. That was something that they wanted to hold on to that land. And there are many different ways that we can talk about this. And it essentially was that a lot of these white men at the time uh, were very racist in believing that these Native Americans could not provide for themselves, but also saying that, you know, um, I'm going to find many different ways to uh, sort of hinder this population. And there are many different times in which we can look at this, and this is something that bleeds into today, that Native, especially Native women, are going missing. Um, a lot of Native Americans had gone missing at the time, and all of a sudden, this white man would show up with a um, papers and say, hey, I have the right to this land. This Native American I was assigned to and was partners with no longer um, has the rights because they have passed or gone missing or, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever that looks like. So you would find a lot of cases of white men going into these territories and making friends with Native Americans and basically stealing their papers afterwards, or um, in their own right, murdering them, uh, hiring people to make them go missing, intimidate them, um, as well as marrying into these families where they would marry, um, fall, in fall in love with a Native American woman, have children with her, and 10 years down the line in the middle of the night, he would um, slaughter his family. Uh, and um, take the land and the papers with him. So there are many different ways that we can look at this and it's not easy to talk about. It's not something that is that is good to, to know in terms of our mental health, but it's, in, it's important and intrinsic to understanding the populations we are working with today. Also, um, we already know about the history of the Trail of Tears. Um, this is just something I wanted to point out because this talks about the displacement of Native Americans and uh, it was the displacement of 125,000 Native Americans. Oh, excuse me, history.com, where they lived on the land um, and essentially uh, moved. Um, and a lot of them have passed away because of such harsh moving conditions. Also, Smithsonian, I believe you also have to have a uh, subscription to, but as, no, actually, as you're clicking through this, um, there were so many different ways that we can talk about the. Um, uh, an early history of Native Americans. And it was a really hard read because um, it talks a lot about death and destruction and sexual assaults and uh, things like that. But it is important for us to know, um, to know the land that has uh, witnessed so much of this. And it also talks about the importance of Native Americans and their, um, their connectedness to the land as well. So um, alcohol and its role, and we're going to sort of be moving into this so that we can understand why um, substance use disorder is so prevalent in these communities. Um, first thing is that it's been reported uh, as of present day that 12% of all Native American deaths have been linked to alcoholism, more than three times the national average. And this is considering the fact that the nations make up 2% of the U.S. population. And so this is uh, discussing a lot right here. Also, um, we are looking at this, um, that there was a, my apologies, I just want to make sure that, yes, this is it. Um, so uh, this blog talks a lot about Native American populations and is by a person who identifies as Native American. And they talked about the role of alcohol and um, how it sort of plays a role in this as well. And what they had found was that 
alcohol was a trade. It was a currency, meaning that this was something that was very prevalent in the discussions and the implementation and the socialization of white men and white settlers and Native American relationships, because they essentially would use this alcohol to make merry and have them sign papers when they were drunk and they would sign over land rights without knowing exactly what it said. Um, also, there are many different ways that we can talk about this in modern day, and this is a great blog that goes into the many different ways that alcoholism has affected um, uh, affected the way uh, these people um, you know, sort of interact with their environments on the day to day. But um, there are many uh, different areas that we can look at, and I think this is a great way to sort of um, look at that as well. And there is a study that was done. Um, it is linked uh, in the description below. So if you want to look at that, uh, it sort of talks about the trading, the currency, and the diplomacy. Now, we talked about the white men and the Native Americans sort of having a role in um, this. But what we haven't realized and what we sort of haven't discussed in a while is that <clears throat> it was part of the diplomacy. It was part of you know, the trading, the, the currency, but more so specifically saying, hey, if we're going to trade off this, um, what's in that barrel over there? Can I have some? And obviously at the time, a lot of Native Americans didn't, and no one really knew the ramifications of what long-term alcohol use could do to them. And before then, what they had found and what had been studied was that the Native Americans' responses to alcohol were heavily influenced by white frontiersmen. Um, and they, uh, white, the, the white frontiersmen would drink um, uh, immoderately, meaning that they would drink uh, quite a bit um, and engage in otherwise unacceptable behaviors when drunk. Now, when we're looking at this, it's the tool of diplomacy in that it was saying, hey, if you can do this, then we can do that. But also the way that they were introduced to this alcohol was that these alcohol um, barrels, this rum, this tequila, this whatever, was not something that was native to Native Americans. This form of uh, alcohol was introduced to them through um, European settlers. Now, the reason why this is important is because we are looking at the beginnings of alcoholism and the beginnings of a maladaptive coping skill for the Native American population. And when this does make its role in and when it, make it, it makes itself known, it is something that uh, can be detrimental to the population we are speaking about. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about reservations. I'm going to be um, playing a video uh, and this is based on um, a really good uh, a YouTube channel called Cut and they essentially interview a lot of different people and make out poignant information um, based on the populations they're interviewing at the time. So let's talk about this, reservations. Reservation. <laughs> Damnation. Bleak. Oppression. Small. Small. They're beautiful and sad at the same time. It's beautiful because you're surrounded by people that are just like you. But it's sad because everything that affects big cities, whether it's drugs or alcohol or Everything's magnified on a reservation. You see it up front, like in your face. Sick. You know, there's alcoholism, there's, you know, there's abuse, there's a domestic violence. There's, there's a lot of things that go on on a reservation that really goes overlooked. Just a compromise. It was an agreement based, well, a forced agreement probably, that Native Americans were put kind of out of the way, out of sight. Yeah. Prison. It's like where we're trapped. Do you think it's the most common misconception about reservations? That there's some kind of abundance, that natives are happy, that they're caring for each other, that they live in some ancient way. Ooh, sad. Poor. A concentration camp. Our reservations were made to uh, isolate Indian people uh, and hope that we would die off. 
depressing. Unfair, because they're not as good as other lands. They're the land that the government and people don't want. Trapped? It wasn't great farmland, it wasn't great homeland, and so it kind of feels like a place off to the side. Even to this day, the natives are fighting for rights to keep the little what they have. There are no good reservations. Here's your reservation. You can't go across that boundary. This is your reservation. And I grew up on a Navajo reservation, and we're one of the few lucky people that got to remain where our homelands are. But there are other reservations where people were forced there, and they can't fend for themselves like they used to do in the old days. You can't hunt anymore, you can't fish anymore, because you're just stuck on a reservation on these substandard housing, living in third world country conditions, youths killing themselves because there's no future, there's no hope. That's a reservation to me. So when we sort of look at this, I wanted to play this for many reasons, but more specifically, it's to understand that we can intellectualize um, whatever we talk about all day, and we can talk about a population as if they're um, in another space, but it's to understand that Native Americans are here, that they are not uh, populations that have gone away and that they are living with the ramifications of racist policies that took them from one place and forced them into another and onto land that wasn't very, um, was not very good for them and not fruitful by any means. So there is a really good um, uh, photographic uh, story um, on huckmag.com and so what I want to talk about here is that I have shared this before, but it was so poignant that I wanted to sort of talk about it more because this is not something that uh, is from 50 years ago, it's from five years ago. So um, we're going to look through this. Now, I do want to point out some things here that they are sort of doing a lot of pictures of the Pine Ridge Res Reserve um, Reservation, and they it's in South Dakota. And it sort of is like, uh, there's a lot of invisible borders and we're gonna sort of be talking about that here. Um, so uh, as it said here, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation is located in the Great Plains on the border of Nebraska, bypassed by those traveling along Interstate 90 as it wins its way towards the Black Hills and Rocky Mountains. Now they were sort of set up and it talks about some of the history of reservations. So you can really look into that. Um, it talks about a lot of the people that live there right now. Um, also, you can see the dilapidated housing. Um, my apologies, uh, I should have done a trigger warning beforehand, but there will be something that may be uncomfortable for some people. Um, we're gonna be talking about alcoholism and um, mental health disorder. So I will put a timestamp on that you can jump forward to if you aren't comfortable with that, but we're gonna be moving forward. Um, so there are uh, a lot of different things. Uh, and it follows quite a bit of these uh, men that live, or these boys that live on this population, in this uh, in this population. And <clears throat> it says here, unable to got, get a job, Rich and his brother have been both involved in gangs. In addition, a high suicide rate and high school dropout rate. The residents of Pine Ridge face other daily battles. The diabetes rate is 800% higher than the national average. With a life expectancy, of 50 years old. The unemployment rate of Pine Ridge hovers around 80%, uh, with the majority of population living under federal poverty standards. Um, also throughout the reservation, um, oh yes, this was another one. Um, many community elders are involved in ongoing efforts to inspire the youth, involving them in cultural and spiritual activities, but it can be difficult to have them go through that. Um, also, healthy food is difficult to come by on a reservation and is often more expensive. In addition, the commodity food provided by the federal government is largely inappropriate for the highly diabetic population. So a lot of it happened to be canned goods, boxed goods, uh, dried pastas, rice, things like that. Um, also, parents nowadays aren't really being parents. Um, these are the sentiments for a lot of different things. Um, this is a park. Uh, this is supposed to be a park. And a front yard, sorry, that's a front yard. 
Um, and so there are many different ways that we can look at this. I, I want to go through a lot of it, but just for the interest of time, I don't want to, you know, go through everything. Um, but they, there's a lot of uh, cigarettes, uh, tobacco smoking, alcoholism, um, drugs, gangs, things like that. It says here, Rich Lone Elk, not pictured, explains the role rap music has come into play. Um, so he is a rapper as well. Um, and this is something that I wanted to point out because it is so pervasive and it is something that speaks volumes. A man sleeps in White Clay, Nebraska, White Clay, population 17 and just two miles from Pine Ridge consists of four liquor stores that sells an average of 12,500 cans of beer a day, mostly to the residents of Pine Ridge Reservation. So you can imagine the rates of alcoholism that exist. Um, also, uh, she walks through the kitchen looking for cleaning water to drink. Um, many people live on the Pine Reservations don't have running water or electricity. Um, this is also self-harm scars um, from an attempted suicide uh, because he was released from prison. Um, also, the, uh, there are many people that die very soon on these reservations. Um, many of them uh, take their own lives or succumb to health problems. A lot of uh, mental health and a lot of teen pregnancy, as well as um, birth control, is not always accessible on these populations. Darlene tends to tends her two daughters who are fighting for their mother's attention in a housing complex. She has six children and doesn't have time to leave them to go to work. Now, this is just some of the realities of the reservation, but this is something that is not you know, 500 years ago when Native Americans were much more relevant, this is now, this is right now. Um, so when we're looking at this, this is something to sort of keep in mind as we think about Native populations. Also, when we are turning to this, um, also uh, the youth usage rate is one in six for alcoholism, um, and, sorry, and engaging in substances in general. Um, and this is for one in six Native American children. So anybody below the age of 18. And when we're talking about reservations, I have a study that was done um, on the uh, one specific residential school that existed in New York. Um, now, when we're talking about these reservations um, and these sort of residential schools in general, um, I think that we're sort of, um, we should honor that in a way that is different. And the reason I'm talking about residential schools is because it will be mentioned in the next slide, but essentially residential schools were a school where white men and white populations in general could de-savage um, these native populations. So they were in, under harsh conditions. And the um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about actually is in Canada, but um, residential schools in general were not safe for a lot of Native American youths. Um, and it says here, essentially, 6,000 Indigenous children died in Canadian residential schools. Canada had a total of 150 schools. That is a lot of schools. But when we look at this, the um, American uh, and in the United States specifically, the uh, number of reservations, or sorry, my apologies, the uh, residential schools were 300 and 57. Um, now you can imagine if 6,000 Indigenous children died in Canada in these residential schools with a total of 150, with us having 357 in the United States, it's likely the number of students who died in the United States is much higher. And also, it is something that is very hard to talk about, but we're going to be discussing this. The National Archives in Washington, D.C. holds the majority of thousands of student files, and we're going to be talking about the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. And they said here, essentially, the children's death records are kept on index cards and two boxes simply labeled the dead files. But the records themselves are incomplete. All of the male children with the last names L through Z are missing. And the bodies may not even be at Carlisle. Children who didn't die on the campus were sent home to die, but the tribes may not have recorded the death. Others died at a nearby sanatorium. At least 11 died while in the so-called outing program, which put Native children to work for little to no pay for white families in Pennsylvania, New York, and you guessed it, New Jersey, as housekeepers or farm laborers. 
So as we're talking about this, these residential schools essentially were meant to erase the history of uh, these populations and these people, um, because most some of them are still alive today, um, they are living with the ramifications of that and living with that trauma <clears throat> and are not able to provide the best care for their family. So here we go. Also, we're going to be talking about language. Language is something that is so important for a lot of different reasons. Language, not just in that the way that we address Native populations, but also language in that their exact language, their exact population is not, are living with the ramifications of this ethnic cleansing. And so we're going to sort of be talking about this as well. Language dead. Not a lot of natives speak their uh, native tongue. Well, my grandma was in a boarding home getting beaten for speaking her language. Important. I think the strongest thing that you could do as an indigenous person is to learn your language. Important. The native language of my tribe is on the verge of being completely forgotten. My grandmother grew up speaking that as her very first language. She unfortunately lived in a time where they were trying to remove that language and so she would get in trouble in school for speaking it and so in turn she didn't pass it down to my mom or to us. Vital. Just like in any, any language there are certain words or ideas or concepts that just can't be easily or even translate it all into something different. It connects you to your history, it connects you to so many other aspects. Sacred. I personally am learning Diné, the Navajo language, and I find that very sacred. Is there any phrase you would like to uh, share with us? Yate. Um, hi. Sacred. With my tribe, I recently started to learn my language. Um, it's becoming less and less known through tribal communities and eventually there's going to be no one who can speak uh, the Chehalis language. Is there uh, any phrase that you would like to say? Um, I can introduce myself. I take Itachi Sunsayash Eaton Squat, Brooke Allen. That means good day, they call me Brooke Allen. I know some of my language. To say your name, to introduce yourself, it would be That's, hello, my name is Holy Bluebird Woman. That's my Indian name. Culture. Important. Communication. It's communication. In residential schools, like, kids weren't allowed to talk their native tongue, and people are losing their languages is a result of that. Very powerful, very, very powerful. World War II would not have been successful without the Navajo Code Talkers and other Native groups that used their languages. Even though with this, the boarding school system, our languages were forbidden to the young ones. We weren't allowed to speak it. Extremely powerful. As technology advances, our heritage and cultures are fading away. I was robbed. I don't know how to talk my language. I wasn't taught. Forgotten. I've gone out to try to learn my language, but no one really knows it. Do you think uh, if a language disappears, the culture disappears? I am afraid so. So obviously very powerful, but um, I think the point here to make is that when we are using language, it's not just how we use labels, it's not just how we interact with one another, it's that language is so deeply rooted, especially in the Native American population, of how they interpret themselves and the people around them and the worlds that they're interacting with. Um, also, just as a side note, when we're talking about language, it's communication, it's connection. So social connection is important to addiction recovery. And this is a great blog about it. But it sort of makes a lot of good points where it says connection is a basic human need. Using drugs to fill a void may literally 
be true. And they sort of break it down here where if you are not socially connected to people, if you do not feel socially connected because you are from a population that has been stripped of its identity, how do you interact with the world? How do you interpret it? These are the sorts of things that are really hard questions and don't have easy answers. So when we are talking about this, we don't want language and connection to be a source of stress. We want it to be a source of strength. But in our own right, if we are looking at this, it's to understand that Native American populations in general have lost that connectedness due to the ethnic cleansing that they had to go through. Now, also um, understanding that loneliness uh, fuels addiction in that we ta already talked about the um, reservations and their life on reservations and so many different realities to that. And we're talking about this here, the Recovery Centers of America, um, this is a great resource, talks about how loneliness can fuel that addiction because you are fueling a void, you are filling a void, but you are fighting loneliness in your own right because you are not connected to enough people or to enough to understand what you can do with your feelings. And also if we are looking at this um, and we're looking at language, when people do interact with that and interact with recovery and interact with finding uh, something on overcoming their addiction, it is understanding that if we use language that is appropriate in our treatments, if we use language in appropriate, that is appropriate in our education, it is the only way that we can reach people from the perspectives that they are coming from. Because if it is not culturally founded, it is not well-intentioned. And if it is not well-intentioned, then why would they seek out the treatment in the first place? So um, that is something uh, to keep in mind um, as we move forward. And this is a great uh, YouTube channel, by the way. I highly recommend investigating their stuff. Um, overall, we are looking at life expectancy here, overall health. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the most uh, prevailing thing here um, that is about life expectancy is that life expectancy depends on what part of the population they're in. We talked about on reservation, specifically the Pine Ridge Reservation, but the life expectancy in that specific reservation for that specific population for these Native Americans is 50 years old. And that is, that's lucky if they make it to 50 years old, considering the conditions they have to go through, considering they don't have running water and electricity. Um, also understand that they are, have a very high likelihood of diabetes. Um, they are twice as likely, about two thirds, they're twice as likely to have diabetes compared to the white populations. And two thirds of kidney failure cases are related to diabetes. Also understand that the life expectancy overall in the United States of all races is 4.4 uh, years less on average. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Um, we, uh, there was another statistic that I wanted to look into very quickly, um, and it talks about the uh, overall health expectancy population, but alcoholism as well. Um, the rate of alcoholism here is that in the past month, 35.9% um, and the past year, 54.3% alcohol use among Native Americans is significantly higher than other ethnic groups. Nearly a quarter of Native Americans report binge drinking in the past month. The rate of Native Americans with an alcohol use disorder is 7.1, and that is higher than that of the total population. And that is to say, those are the people that admit that they have an alcohol use disorder, so the number could vary to be higher. Three in 10 Native American young adults report binge drinking. Um, one in 11 report heavy alcohol use and one in 10 have alcohol use disorder. Um, and they said that was in the past month. Um, and as we said before, one in six Native American adolescents um, engage in underage drinking, which is the highest rate of alcohol use of all racial and ethnic groups. Also, we have here um, intersectionality and why it's important, and we're sort of looking at this, that overall health is not just eating better, eating right, um, exercising, and engaging in good practices. It's understanding that intersectionality is generational trauma, meaning that if we are looking at the way that they interact with their environment, they are still faced with generational trauma every single day, meaning that if that intersectionality and the way that they respond to those intersectionalities primes them to make decisions, and if they're not given good ones or they're not given good uh, things to choose from, then the reality is, is that they just won't make the decisions that are best for them because they're not given good choices. 
Um, also understanding why intersectionality is important and how it affects a lot of different ways. It's also understanding that Native Americans uh, who are Native American and Black have a different reality. Native Americans who are Native American and gay, Native American and transgender, Native American and non-binary, um, Native American and disabled, Native American and et cetera, Native American and blind. These are all the sorts of things to understand that there are layers to how people People interact with their environment and being Native American is one facet but being Native American and a woman being Native American being a woman and being blind these are all the sorts of things that are layered against them and it's not saying that they are at the will and at the whim of their intersectionalism but it's understanding that these are the identities and these are the scenarios that they have to interact with to make choices every day and so if we recognize that, it can help us in helping this community. Also some fact sheets on disparities as well, just so we can sort of, uh, this is the Indian Health Service, a great resource for, um, uh, it says the Federal Health Program for American Indians and Alaska Natives. They have many different resources, um, locations, patients, providers, community health, things like that. Um, but as we're all talking about overall health here, um, this was actually data that was collected in 2010, so it is a little bit older, but it is still relevant. Uh, heart disease, um, it talks about the American Indian and Alaskan Native rate versus all races. So um, that is higher than all, all other races. Diabetes is much higher than all other races. Accidents, unintentional injuries, this is usually car accidents and things like that, is higher than all others. Um, malignant neoplasm, which is cancer, um, higher than other rates. And it also talks about the ratio. So it's for every one person that suffers from heart disease, it's one person of all other races. Um, accidents is 2.5 times higher alcohol induced um, uh, you know health is 6.6 .6 times higher uh, lower respiratory diseases is 1.1 1 .1, uh, to everyone um, in flu influenza and pneumonia is 1.8 to everyone drug induced um, uh, drug induced uh, health problems is 1.5 to everyone suicide and self-harm is 20.4 to 12.1, so that's 1.7 times higher than everyone. Um, so these are all things to keep in mind. And in general, just the rate is 1.3 times higher collectively on average for all these mortality disparities. Um, so that is something uh, to keep in mind and that is something to honor and to look at and to make sure that we integrate into our resource giving. Um, I also want to talk about First Nations in New Jersey. I know you're saying, hey, why we talked about history already. Why are we still talking about it? It's because they're around still. And to understand that New Jersey in our own right has the history, it has the abundance, it has the 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 um the resources to that to thank Native Americans for because we all most of our towns are named after First Nation. I know quite a few different uh, towns in New Jersey are named after First Nation, such as Piscataway, um, Lenape, um, Ramapo, um, Wanaku, you know, all those sorts of things. These are the things that we need to keep in mind because we are literally living on land that they used to own and foster and and give so much to. Now, um, the Indigenous Peoples of New Jersey, um, as we're looking at a family search here, it lists some of the state recognized tribes, which were not state recognized up until about 10 years ago. There are also quite a few different records. Um, health records, reports, school census, things like that talks about, and this is from the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs that talks about uh, and natives that are from this area, talks about the reservations that exist, uh, that used to exist in New Jersey, um, that have been compiled. Uh, these are compiled reservations, and we already know what reservation life is like. Um, this is the Renka Coast, Ramapo, Nanatok, Lenin, Len Lenape, Edge Pillock Reservation. I mean, these are some of the resources as well as some websites if you want to learn more about these uh, tribes and bands of New Jersey. Um, the other thing too is that we are talking about, um, there are quite a few different uh, resources we can look at here as well, 500nations.com slash New Jersey tribes. This gives you the updated um, 
the updated resource to reach out to them to possibly uh, do any, um, you know, uh, contributions or to learn more or anything like that. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Um, and it says here, there are no federally recognized tribes in New Jersey. That is true. We are only, they are only state recognized. Um, so that is something to keep in mind as well. And it talks about all the other tribes that exist in uh, New Jersey. So state recognized and other tribes that are technically not federally uh, recognized. So imagine living um, in a society where um, you are recognized in some parts, but not in others. So these are something to keep in mind as well. Um, and back here, we can look at this is a map of all the First Nation peoples that existed in New Jersey and in the Northeast in general. We have the, uh, you know, the Muncie dialect, the, you know, different dialects that exist here. This is the Lenape tribe. They were very big, um, as well as uh, different, um, you know, just looking at different uh, areas that they had affected. Um, so there are some historic locations, modern locations, and modern reservations. As you can see, there are very little modern reservations that exist in New Jersey, but they do exist. So if we can, let's make our way to them and sort of be educated on those aspects of our lives. Also, we were talking about language and how it's so important before. I mean, it talks about American Indians in New Jersey. Um, obviously, we don't use that language anymore, but that's uh, what this website is using. And native languages, meaning that you can talk about the different languages that exist in New Jersey from these tribes, and you can learn some stuff. So you can uh, print it out, understand it, and um, possibly it could be a good educational resource. Also, it says here, most Native Americans were forced to leave New Jersey during the 1700s when Eastern tribes were displaced by colonial expansion. These tribes are not extinct, um, but these tribes are not extinct, but except for the descendants of New Jersey Native American people who hid or assimilated, um, they do not live in New Jersey anymore. So very few of them live in New Jersey. And this also talks uh, about the Delaware tribes that exist in New Jersey. So um, good resource and good things to address. Um, just uh, closing out, I always do this in my presentations just because it is so relevant to what we're talking about. What can be done? How can we help? And I think that the first thing that we can do is not hide history. Where it can be taught, it should be. Um, believe people when they talk about their struggles. Know the resources in your area specific to the populations you work with. So for example, if you have a Native American population that you are working with, understand the resources that exist in that area. And if not in that area, knowing where to find those resources is an important part of your job that should be happening. Um, listen to the stories of people who want to share them. Um, the great thing about Native American history is that it is an oral history, meaning that they love telling their stories because when they tell their stories, their history, their story, their spirit lives on. Also, put credit where it belongs. Representation matters. Um, have interesting and complex stories about people that are respectful and well-intentioned. So for example, if you find something that could be a great educational resource, make sure it is a great educational resource and doing the research on the things that we share in our classrooms with others and um, within our own spaces to educate on these issues is an important piece as well. Also monitor changes in behavior of these specific populations, especially. Be involved in their lives. Um, know that if they come to you for something, they feel comfortable with you and therefore you should honor that. Also lead by example. So if we are using the right language, if we are approaching history in the best way, if we are saying all the things that matter in this context, then it's important for us to honor that and to move forward with that to hopefully provide good resources to this population. Um, I'm going to close out my presentation with uh, two quotes from two Native Americans. Um, and one is, everything on the earth has a purpose. Every disease has an herb to cure it and every person a mission. This is the Indian theory of existence. And um, this was by someone who was from the Salish nation. And when we're sort of talking about this as well, I don't want to say that, you know, um, Native Americans, we should uh, sort of I don't want to, um, what's the word, uh, appropriate any of the things that they're saying, but at the same time, understanding that they are, their connectedness to the earth and their land is so intrinsic to who they are, that it is a very spiritual process for them. And when that is taken away, then it is very hard for them to uh, find their identities. Um, also to understand that um, it's not just the way that this person had said it, it's understanding that 
if they are connected, if they believe in the theory of everything being connected, feeling disconnected because of being on the reservation, feeling disconnected because of feeling like their history isn't taught in schools and history isn't being talked about, that can be something that can be detrimental to a population. So talking about it, being connected to it, educating on it is a huge part of their identity as well. And also we must protect the forests for our children, grandchildren and children yet to be born. We must protect the forest for those who can't speak for themselves such as the birds, animals, fish and trees. And this is by Chief Edward Moody from the Nocock Nation. Now, when we are sort of talking about this as well, it's understanding that they have such a holistic view of the way that they view their families and their approaches to life that if they live for the idea that they will have grandchildren and their children's children that we are living in a society that is better for everyone and everything so um, i think we can learn some things and i think that we can you know definitely integrate these uh schools of thought into what we do but also identifying how we can help the native american population in general so thank you for being here. Thank you for um, being here and wanting to learn something new. I will see you all next week.